All right, so let's get started. Um, <clears throat> please keep quiet. As I mentioned last time on Friday, we started discussing the terrorism issue. It is something definitely of great significance on its own, regardless of any specific region. But of course, Middle East, for a number of reasons, is one of the regions where terrorism is seen more often. And of course, with great casualty rates and a number of attacks, especially in Iraq, while the frequency and the uh, number, the overall number of attacks may have been uh, decreased over the last couple of years, but still, whenever there is a suicide bombing or roadside bombing um, performed or uh, carried out with uh, improvised explosive devices, and which are called IEDs, uh, of course, uh, we keep hearing on the news that there are uh, dozens of casualties, of course, big damage, human loss. These are very, very important issues. And uh, this is uh, <clears throat> a presentation that I made uh, as the academic advisor of NERA Center of Excellence Defense Against Terrorism. And I got these flags from that center. This is, uh, of course, uh, courtesy to their trust in me in my work. If there is any question out there, you can ask me rather than asking your classmates who may not have the answer. All right? So um, we will therefore discuss today uh, in two hours, uh, maybe on Friday uh, as well. Uh, in just one hour, we will cover this terrorism issue. And I, I have the intention to conduct a little bit of a, a rehearsal uh, on Friday, at least for uh, like 10, 15, 20 minutes uh, in order to prepare you for the next week's simulation so that uh, you know what you are going to do and how you will act, what kind of uh, roles you will have within your groups and within the overall simulation. Anyway, so uh, starting with the uh, subject, of course, it is always useful to identify the subject. And we discussed a little bit um, uh, on Friday, and we uh, emphasize that there are basically <clears throat> two issues with respect to the um, uh, struggle against terrorism. One is a definition of terrorism, and that not everybody defines uh, cer certain acts which may or may not involve uh, violence as terrorism, and there is therefore deep divergences of opinion as to what constitutes terrorism or a terrorist act, and that this is something that is one of the biggest stumbling blocks in, uh, in front of cooperation. And another issue, as we discussed also a little bit within this uh, one hour uh, on Friday last week, was the necessity of having proper intelligence. Proper intelligence, actionable intelligence, that is intelligence, necessary intelligence, reliable intelligence, uh, necessary in terms of uh, uh, the substance, the amount of uh, information coming with that in intelligence, and also reliable sources must be reliable, and also uh, intelligence must not come after a terrorist attack is carried out already. So it must be timely so that uh, security forces or intelligence uh, units may take steps to prevent any attack from occurring. And from time to time, uh, we learn from uh, the press releases or certain information that may leak to the press or from other sources that even though the large populations may not be aware of, uh, there, there, may, there were several, several attempts, terrorist attacks, uh, which were thwarted and which were just prevented from occurring by the security forces, police, uh, the military, the intelligence, uh, whomever might be involved. So therefore, intelligence is one of the most important instruments, most important assets in the fight against terrorism. And uh, it is also the area where cooperation is not only needed the most, but also the most difficult. So therefore, these are the two issues, intelligence sharing and difficulties in intelligence sharing and definition of terrorism, and of course, a divergence of opinion in the definition of terrorism. Having uh, emphasized this, I believe, enough last Friday, I think we can go ahead with uh, identifying the, the overall problem again, bearing in mind that uh, the two issues, in definition and intelligence sharing, are the important uh, 
issues that you know we are dealing with in academia and also in the academic dimensions of uh, the sort of institutions uh, who are dealing with this problem. Um, as I emphasize here, the world is getting, of course, thanks to globalization. Globalization is not always something that may have brought with it a number of opportunities, but also there, there are certain difficulties. There are certain problems emanating from uh, you know, rather high, high pace of uh, globalization. Well, <clears throat> there are certain issues which are definitely very good for the humanity. There are no borders. You can reach from uh, one part of the world to the other part of the world, depending on, of course, what kind of uh, transportation uh, uh, medium you may have. Or, or you can also deliver services uh, to every single corner of the world, thanks to the uh, capabilities that are advanced with globalization. But this globalization also created a very and highly interdependent uh, and complex interdependence occurs, a highly inter interdependent world. And because of this, vulnerabilities uh, of states increase. And, and certain threats are emanating just merely from this increase in globalization. So certain threats which may have been located, which may have been isolated in certain parts of the world, now have become also global. So uh, threats have become global. And states, of course, uh, not all of them, maybe not, not any one of them, uh, uh, not all of them are endowed with or uh, with necessary capabilities to, 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 to deal with them. So it is therefore essential that you know, states bring together their capabilities and fight against this uh, predicament. Uh, all together, especially after 9-11, we have seen that not even the United States is capable of dealing with uh, uh, the, the threat of terrorism. Yes, uh, the United States is, may not be looking forward to getting uh, the fullest cooperation of every single nation that, are, uh, that is uh, you know, willing to cooperate with the United States. There are certain uh, different opinion as to on what grounds um, this cooperation should occur, but still it is a big problem. So uh, what is important to underline here is that the distinction between international security and national security, or some <clears throat> prefer to call it homeland security, is getting blurred. I mean, in the past and still is today, I mean, this, I don't really, by this argument that no nation states have evaporated, have just uh, uh, dissolved, there is no such thing as nation state anymore. Well, there may be, yeah, yes, uh, the borders are lifted. There is this uh, high pace of globalization, global cooperation, trade, you know, communication, everything uh, became global. But still, nation states are still the very important, if not the single most important, but very important units of analysis in international relations, and states are still important. So um, it is not possible to get rid of state stru structures or to undermine their significance or their power or their effectiveness. So whenever something happens, you look around for a state uh, institution to help you out if there is a problem. Uh, so therefore, uh, this is not something that I uh, I agree with, but uh, what I agree is that uh, in the past states were more capable of, as I mentioned, to isolate the problem and solve within their own borders and deal with the problem uh, on their own if uh, that was the case. But because of this globalization, security problems have also become global and international security and national sec security uh, are not necessarily highly distinct areas. I mean, there is this uh, huge amount of overlap. So uh, therefore, what is important here is uh, that a coalition of the willing as well as capable partners is necessary for conducting effective counterterrorism operations. So coalition of the willing and capable. So what is important, willing and uh, coalition of willing who are uh, enthusiastic 
and capable. So a group of countries which are not only determined to deal with terrorism but also must be capable or not only capable but must be willing because there are certain countries which are capable of dealing with terrorism but may be staying away from cooperating with other states or there are certain states which are willing to cooperate but don't have much capability to help with your efforts. So uh, what is important to note here is that states which are fighting against terrorism must be both willing and capable to do so. This is important to note here. Well, uh, this issue, especially the willingness issue, is still a problem. And what I understand, this is my conviction, this is my you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, understanding based on my observations, based on my studies with respect to you know, states' behaviors vis-a-vis uh, -vis terrorist activities, is that um, the definition is not only, uh, the, the, or the, the problem of definition is not only an ideological one. There are certain states which may have some problems, ideological or political uh, problems, in terms of defining an act as terrorist act. But some states may be acting that way, that way under the guise of having a political problem or ideological stance vis-a-vis -vis terrorism, but the real cause might be they may not want to be target of terrorism. Because terrorist organizations do usually uh, need a, a, a safe haven to you know, establish their headquarters, to recruit people, to uh, mobilize you know, uh, uh, some funds, to raise some funds. So, in order to sustain their activities, to get to arm themselves, uh, to give training, whatever. So, uh, as we discussed last time as well, uh, you know, on Friday, uh, I gave this example of Syria harboring uh, the PKK as a terrorist organization, and that brought Turkey and uh, Syria to the brink of a hot confrontation back in 1998. And since then, Turkish Syrian relations are remarkably good. But, uh, uh, you know, there are other states in the world which use, um, as I also mentioned on Friday, which use um, terrorism as a, you know, a proxy strategy, a, a strategy uh, uh, which they believe they can achieve certain goals without openly confronting other states. So use uh, terrorist organizations as an instrument, as a leverage in their relations or in, in, in their activities uh, or policies toward other states, just again like uh, uh, Syria did uh, use PKK against Turkey, which retarded Turkey's southeastern Anatolia project maybe for a couple of decades and cost Turkey hundreds of thousands of, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. Of course, in addition to what is most important, the loss of thousands of people's lives. So, uh, therefore, Terrorist organizations, in most cases, and, but this is not, as we will see, an absolute necessity anymore, but in most cases, terrorist uh, organizations need states sponsoring them or harboring them, providing them shelter, providing them, the, them logistical support, munitions, uh, training, money, whatever. So uh, this is how, you know, this is one aspect of terrorist group and sponsoring or harboring state relations. There are also, well, this is an active uh, sort of relationship between states and state-sponsored terrorist groups. But there are also some states which may not necessarily directly sponsor terrorist organizations, which may not provide them shelter, which may not provide them any uh, logistical support, but they may turn a blind eye to their activities. They may not necessarily uh, do uh, whatever their laws may necessitate them or require them to do in terms of arresting some people or uh, uh, maybe uh, taking some uh, or conducting some investigations about the activities of certain parent uh, companies which are used as you know, uh, uh, you know uh, some uh, instruments to carry out um, illegal activities etc. And uh, Turkey is very much complaining, and we have heard this not only as you know statements from uh, low-level bureaucrats, but we have heard this from the from the level of the president, from the level of prime minister and ministers, 
who have complained time and again the lack of cooperation or lack of understanding between Turkey and Turkey's European allies, not only within NATO, but also considering that Turkey is now a country which has a European membership vocation, which has a perspective, well, no matter how far it may seem to be at this point. And, and Turkey asked from time to time uh, from a number of European states to investigate certain groups uh, or to investigate certain activities or to arrest certain people, uh, individuals, uh, and not in most cases these have been realized. So there is this type of um, uh, disagreements. And what I was trying to say here is that terrorist organizations not only on the one hand conduct activities against certain states or certain groups, but also on, uh, on the other hand, uh, they threaten other states which may not be their primary target, but uh, they tell them in an indirect way or they send them certain messages. There are different ways of uh, messages that could be sent either directly by sending a person to meet some, some person from the government or by uh, carrying out an activity which may be received as a message by the intelligence services of that particular country that if you do something against me, you are not now my target, but you may become my target. So terrorists, certain groups, therefore, certain states, therefore are concerned with the possibility of becoming a target while they are not targeted at this moment, but to become a target in the future if they take certain restrictive actions against the activities of terrorist organizations. So we have seen this in the past. We are now seeing this. Of course, it is not easy to give names here. Uh, and even intelligence services or the police department or you know, other interested units or politicians may not have enough evidence to put on table or you know, uh, mention publicly. But we, we know very well that there are certain states which are motivated in their uh, stance vis-a-vis -vis terrorist activities with the concern in their mind that, well, um, I'm certainly not the target of this terrorist group or this, this type of terrorist activity. But if I you know, provide uh, a certain uh, asset to other states which are dealing with this terrorist group, may, would I become a target of that group? Well, why should um, I make my life uh, a, a difficult one by helping other states uh, in their fight against terrorism. But what must be understood, especially at this stage, I mean, uh, from today and into the future, there is a, a significant change in the profile of terrorist groups and also in the types of activities these terrorist groups are carrying out. Because especially since the end of the Cold War, the profile of terrorist organizations exhibiting stark differences, as I mentioned here. What we knew I mean, uh, I still know, um, as I mentioned last Friday, there are certain terrorist organizations, you know, which are the quick ones that comes, uh, uh, that come to uh, one's mind are, you know, IRA, PKK, Tamils, and ETA, etc. And these are mostly, not exclusively, but mostly motivated by ideological uh, sort of uh, motivations and have mostly, in most cases, have separatist uh, ambitions. And they are found, in most cases, in this more or less a, an identifiable geographical location. They are not dispersed to all parts of the world. They are maybe not in a specific city or town, but they can be found more or less within a uh, certain uh, boundary. And uh, there is a clear, uh, uh, top-down hierarchical structure. I mean, there is a leader. Some of them may not be known well uh, by the public or by, by the uh, intelligence services, but there are at least a small um, cadre of uh, leadership uh, cadre, people in, 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 in the, who have, may have established, you know, formed the group and take decisions about the next attack or whom to recruit or what kind of political goals to forward to, to, to you know, put on table to claim, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, and these are uh, such organizations 
that the intelligence services, security forces, have a huge amount of information about them. Well, and in, in most cases, even in, including Hamas and Hezbollah, well, some define as terrorist organizations, some do not consider them as terrorist organizations. But anyway, uh, intelligence services may have infiltrated into this, these groups. And they may get you know, uh, reliable intelligence, sometimes may not be very timely because of the difficulties of you know, giving in the information out from within the group. But in most cases, these, these groups are well known by and large as to where they are, who they are, more or less, what are their ambitions, what are their capabilities. I mean, how many people they have, for instance, there is this uh, 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 certain understanding about uh, the, the the armed units of the PKK on the Kandil Mountains. There is this figure, which varies from four to five thousand uh, terrorists on the mountains, and some thousand or fifteen hundred within the Turkish uh, frontier with, uh, in, on uh, Turkish territory. So. I mean, there are this uh, kind of information that are more or less uh, reliable and, and uh, which makes sense. Islam, any question about this attendance? So, um, but since the end of the Cold War, the profile is changing. I don't mean to say that all the other types of what or some people call traditional, well, I don't know whether there's anything traditional with respect to them, but for the ease of understanding, in order to make a distinction between the two types, broad, of course, categories, not specific categorization, two broad categories of uh, terrorist organizations, uh, especially after the call, uh, end of the Cold War period, this, these differences are becoming uh, much more uh, clear and also uh, make a distinction in terms of uh, the fight against these groups. And this, this, these differences must be properly understood beforehand because without properly identifying the problem, you cannot uh, sort of come up with a number of strategies as to how to cure the problem. So it is therefore necessary to understand it, this thing. And what we see, I mean, when compared to what we have so far known as traditional uh, terrorist organizations, about which we had more or less uh, you know, reliable and satisfactory information about capabilities, identities, whereabouts, you know, the coordinates, and whatever, or ambitions, etc. These are still around, and they are not likely to go anywhere anytime soon. No one claims that, well, there is no more, not anymore, any such terrorist organizations. Yes, there are still around. But added to this, a new dimension of terrorist activity, or a, a new, new sort of a more or less broad group of uh, terrorist uh, organizations, which are different than what we have known so far. And we have understood this uh, from their activities uh, over the last uh, couple of decades. And these are transnational networks of uh, local organizations. I mean, unlike the so-called traditional terrorist organizations, which ha uh, have more or less a headquarters somewhere, and the leadership cadre somewhere, and in a rather close distance, not too far, there is this you know, other you know, backup units or training groups or recruits or armed units and whatever, logistical support training areas, etc. Unlike this, now the whole world, uh, the, the world is now the sort of uh, the headquarters of uh, this kind of organizations. If not the headquarters, are the sort of, uh, uh, there are locations where small units of this kind of transnational, what is important here is transnational network. This, this is something that, you know, that is across the nations uh, around the world. So this is one thing. Secondly, against what we have known so far that most separatist terrorist organizations were motivated by ideological you know, uh, stance uh, with their you know, distinct ideological stance. 
Now, this kind of transnational network of local organizations are motivated by religious or mystical beliefs. Uh, for instance, uh, the mystical belief, what I mean, uh, the Aum Shurikyo, for instance. Uh, have you heard about this, uh, you know, Tokyo subway attack on March 8, 1995? A dozen people were killed. Uh, they, they tried to implant syringas in the uh, Tokyo subway. And uh, they were planning to release this gas in different uh, parts of the Tokyo subway by pointing or just you know by exploding these small bags of sarin gas with the you know uh, uh, tip of the umbrellas, but they were they were not hopefully successful. Yet a dozen people were killed from the gas which was released, and four or five thousand people were injured. Some of them because the gas you know uh, caused damage to their lungs, to their body, to their tissues, etc. So uh, there are such groups and. Their mystical philosophy, whatever it is, is uh, something that is known as having caused what they have at sort of stage uh, in March 1995. And up until that time, Japan, in Japan, actually, because they're uh, mostly there, uh, Aum Shurikyo was not, a, um, was not an organization which was sort of, or whose activities were limited by uh, the you know, uh, laws of Japan. And because of this different difference, difference of opinion or differences of understanding in the Japanese culture, they have not uh, condoned their activities until this attack took place. And even then, after uh, Am Shurikyo's attack in March 95, uh, they also tried to continue uh, uh, to some of their activities. But what we know when we talk about, or what we talk more about uh, transnational networks of local organization, uh, most of them are known as motivated by religious beliefs. So this is something that we have not seen much until, uh, you know, most recently. And again, what is interesting to note, um, when you think of the PKK, the ETA, or Tamils, yes, apart from the leadership cadre, some of them who are ideologues, uh, who, are, uh, who may have been educated at universities or in some institutions, and the rest are foot soldiers, you know, mostly recruits from villages, from the lowest strata in terms of economic sort of uh, uh, capabilities or whatever. <clears throat> but now, what we see, I mean, based on reports that are released to the academic circles and to, to the media, that there are people who are highly educated and also competent in many issues, in many areas. And it is not just you know, a matter of foot soldier who carries an AK-47, a Kalashnikov, or just who lives on the mountains for an extended duration, or you know, who is just taking orders and either blows himself up or just uh, carries a, an attack with machine guns and kills people. No, there are people with degrees, with PhDs, with even uh, other higher degrees and also competence and also with some distinguished uh, careers in diplomatic, academic, military fields. Yes, th th this is not highly pervasive. This is not, uh, you know, I don't mean to say that every single member of uh, these groups uh, is such and such person. But now in transnational networks of local organizations which are motivated by religious or mystical beliefs, there are people uh, which, who are highly educated and very, very competent in some issue areas. And therefore, you're not just you know, thinking of a typical terrorist who uh, lives uh, in miserable conditions uh, with you know, in a, f a few hand grenades and AK-47. No, this is not. Not at all the case anymore. So uh, this is therefore something that must be properly understood. I mean, un unless you know what you're up against, you may not sit back and you know, draw certain strategies as to how to deal with that problem. And what is uh, more important in that, as I mentioned at the very last moment of uh, last Friday's session, is that cooperation is needed all the more uh, and more than ever in the face of the threats posed by weapons of mass destruction. 
And because uh, you know, this is something that relates and not only religious uh, dimension, but also competent people, highly educated people, and also access to other networks of uh, illegal activities like smuggling ac uh, activities, trafficking activities, you know, uh, who may have access, have access to a number of uh, material that can be weaponized or weapons themselves. Because uh, in the former Soviet territory, there are still problems. Yes, uh, the problem has been uh, dealt with to a great extent with the help of the so-called Nalnugur program or the Cooperative Trade Reduction Program, which uh, established a, a strong link between the United States and uh, Russia or US Senate or in Russian Duma, which brought together the state structures of both the, uh, Uni uh, the United States and the former Soviet republics, which have earned their independence uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Or uh, that was because uh, the collapse has come anyway. And the, the, the immediate utmost concern of the United States and those who were knowledgeable about the dimensions of the problem, the utmost concern was what would happen to the weapons in the I mean, chemical, biological, nuclear weapons, and also material that could be weaponized and technology and scientific knowledge that were in an abundant amount of uh, uh, this uh, this kind of weapons and the capabilities that were still available, which still uh, up uh, in the market in the former Soviet territory. And the United States has initiated uh, this uh, cooperative threat reduction, the cooperation between the United States and Russia to deal with the threat, to, to reduce the threat, cooperative threat reduction, non Luger known after the name of uh, two U.S. Senators, Nan Luger, Cooperative Threat Reduction. With, this is something which has evolved now in global partnership, something that is much bigger. And the aim was to uh, seal what was there and not to let the weapons, uh, the material that could be weaponized, technology, technological parts, technical capabilities and scientific capabilities, not to let them spread to the rest of the world or pass into the hands of those who are looking forward to receiving any or all of these capabilities, such as uh, uh, Iran and North Korea, Libya, Iraq, Syria. These were the states of concern in the eyes of the United States. And that's why, as I mentioned earlier, uh, during the Clinton administration, Iran and Iraq were subject to what was called dual containment, etc., etc. So, therefore, taking into consideration this change in the profile of terrorist organization, looking at uh, their motivations and their structure, motivations and the capabilities, of course, the threat posed by weapons of mass destruction is bec becoming much more serious a threat. I mean. Yes, it is what we call a low probability, high consequence scenario. Well, of course, when you talk about these people, one of the first things people ask, well, so far, if it was that easy, why didn't it happen that you know, already? Well, of course, 9-11 was not a very difficult thing as we have seen, but 9-11 you know, did not happen uh, on 9-10 or 9-9, whatever. Until something happens, people tend to underestimate or undermine that some such and such thing is likely. But one, once it happens, especially after having seen the consequences, then people you know, cry out and say, what should we do, do about it? Well, it's too late for doing certain things. Still not late to do other things or to, uh, to take other precautions or at least to mitigate you know, the, the, or to, damage, to limit the damage or the sort of the, the collateral damages to prevent the second or you know, other third attacks, etc. But what is important to bear in mind is that, yes, they may not happen, occur, they may not occur every single day, but once, if and when it happens, the consequences are high. Are you ready to bear the consequences? That's the question. So if you're 
not concerned about the consequences, I don't care. Well, that's uh, God's will. If thousands or hundreds of thousands of people are going to die, well, that's not a big deal. We have several mil billions of, in the world. Well, this cannot be the answer of a statesman. A statesman or a responsible officer, security officer, intelligence officer, an academic, or a politician is to take the necessary measures which in the first place would prevent such an occurrence and if fail to prevent then limit the damage. So this is what we call indeed arms control or you know, uh, taking some actions in order to uh, limit the uh, or to lower the probability but still the consequences are so high that even the smallest probability must or might be uh, serious enough to, you know, uh, to bear in mind and to take certain counteractions. Okay, let's uh, give a break before we continue with the next slide and we'll see what comes next. <laughs>